and we give all our glory to him. We, if we have any crowns at all, we cast them at his feet. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so we don't need to worry or, or be concerned that we haven't seen any people coming forth in great victory in this church age. Well, you even look at the statistics. The statistics look terrible, like, well, maybe 95%, maybe 98% of the world are born-again Christians, and all the rest don't know him. But you know God has a plan. He knows exactly what he's doing. And so he's been taking his seed from the seed uh, to the sprouting, watering them. This 2,000 years, he's been watering his church and watering them and working in them. And now we're at the end of that church age, ready to come in to the next dispensation. And God is doing a marvelous finishing work because he's preparing a people for the Feast of Tabernacles, for the fullness of the corn in the ear to come forth. Are you tired? Shall I continue? I kind of, I don't know if I should go into the Feast of Tabernacles or not. I could really get carried away if I do, but that's okay. I will. <laughs> I will just tell you this briefly, that the Feast of Passover is a mixed bag, if you didn't already know, a mixture of flesh and spirit. We're going through the wilderness and he's testing us and we're murmuring and complaining and grumbling and wanting to go back to Egypt and all that jazz, Right? That's what we have been doing until we come to a place. Oh, my father. It's like a bride. She's been so wooed by her lover until she looks at him and she realizes, all I really want is to be one with this beloved. And so after walking perhaps less than victoriously with the Lord for a number of years, maybe up and down and back and forth and backslidden or whatever, in this leavened bread condition, finally you come to the fact that I have a bridegroom. And like I said, the baby didn't know anything about the mother's nature. We begin to know something of the nature of the bridegroom. We begin to relate to him like a bride relates to her beloved on a basis of love. Well, I heard the call of the bride here tonight. Did you not hear it? The bride was just calling unto her beloved with her whole heart. And so this is part of Pentecost. She grows up from a child into a bride and wants to be one with her beloved. She begins to love the Lord for what he is, not for what he can give her. No, it's not anymore a gimme, gimme God. If it is, you see somebody still with that concept, you know where they are. They're still little children wanting good things from their father. And God doesn't despise his little children. I'm not knocking anybody, but that's where they are. But when they come to a place, like I heard tonight, where they're longing to be one with the heart of the father, then you know that the bride is being prepared. And the bride must be prepared by the Holy Spirit. And in Ephesians 1, it speaks of the dowry of the bride. It speaks of the inheritance. And do you know what your dowry was? Well, you know, when a man was going to, to marry a bride and he had agreed with her parents, maybe he agreed to give 10 cows for his bride. And that's what they did back there. And at the time of betrothal, he'd leave one cow with them. And you get the other nine when I get the bride. <laughs> and so, this is like Pentecost. At Pentecost, we got one cow. Yeah. We got the down payment on our inheritance. We did not get the whole thing. Sorry about that. We like to think we've had the whole thing. Oh my, do we ever. <laughs> but we have not. We've just had one cow. And don't ever forget this cow story. We just had one cow. And when are we going to get the rest? We're going to get the rest at the next feast. At the Feast of Tabernacles, you're going to have the fullness. But now, he said, you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So that measure that represents the one cow, and it's just a small measure, that measure seals you as a foretaste and a promise, you're going to get all the rest. Yes, you are. You're going to get all the rest. You're in line for the rest. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. 
Oh, glory to God. Oh, that encouraged my heart when I saw that. Uh, it discouraged me a little bit because I thought I had it all, I think, at that point. But it did encourage me to know that at least what I had was sealed until that full possession. And so the full possession is the land. It's where the seed comes to fullness and it possesses the land. And the land is a realm of spirit. Because the Lord is bringing us into the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the very substance of God. And at this particular point in time, we don't just have the righteousness of God imputed unto us as if it were ours. Because he's been working on us all through Pentecost, all through the wilderness testings and trials. And you know what's happened? Now he has inworked it into our hearts. You can take the tablecloth off. And there's no spots there. Because he has come and he's rooted it out. And you know, he said when he's coming this second time, he's coming without sin, not to deal with sin anymore. And so I talk to a large number of people and they say, Oh, Elaine, it, it's really something what we're going through. You know, there are certain areas of our lives we thought we had victory over this. And suddenly... Man, here it is popping up again. And I thought I was finished with it. I thought I'd never see that bad habit or whatever it was. And then when they would pray about it, you know what the Lord would say? You have overcome it to a great degree, but the root is still there. And I'm causing it to be made manifest again because I'm coming now and I'm cutting it out of, by the very roots. I'm cutting the tree out at the root because I'm preparing you for my fullness and there's not room for both of us in there. Are you experiencing this? Oh, my word, you think, what's the matter? How come these things are coming up that I, I thought I had overcome? It's for a very good reason because he is preparing your land. And when Jesus spoke of the land, he said, and he was walking on the earth at the time when he said this, he said, Oh, Father, he prayed, let them be with me where I am. Well, where was he? He was right in terra firma on earth, and they were on earth, so they were in the same place. But he was in the spirit. He was in a spiritual realm where he always heard from his Father, where he could always communicate with his Father. He said, oh, let them be with me where I am, where they can always hear from you, always hear your voice. And so I may not touch a lot on the Feast of Tabernacles, but just a little bit, because I'll go into it further again. But the Feast of Tabernacles has to do with Jesus as King of Glory. Say with me, King of Glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> So we have the blood, we have the voice of God, and now we have the glory. Well, I don't know what you think the glory is, but I was very naive. When I first heard of the glory of God, I thought, oh, glory. Well, that's probably that halo that uh, shows around the head of Christ. You know, in these pictures, he has his halo. That's probably his glory, but that isn't it. The glory of God is his nature. And so when Jesus comes as king of glory, he's coming to bring forth his nature in us. To impart unto him, to in work. He's not just giving us a gift now. He's working it in through our dying to self and living to Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. So I want to show you here in the scriptures how I can tell you that the glory is his nature. In Exodus chapter 33, and verse 18, oh, I love this verse. It's wonderful. <laughs> Moses is saying to God, he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Have you ever said that to the Lord? I bet you have. In one way or another, I'm sure we've all said, oh, Lord, show me thy glory. And so the Lord agreed to do so. And when he agreed to do so, in verse 19, what did God answer him? God said, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. 
So when Moses asked to see his glory, God talked about his goodness. Does that sound like his nature or what? Yes, it did. He said, I'll make all my nature <laughs> pass before thee. I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. So did he go and say, well, my name is Jehovah and it's uh, Yahshua and it's this and that. Did he say that? No. He told his nature. When you see name, it means his nature. I'll proclaim the nature of the Lord before you. I'll proclaim his name, his nature. Hallelujah. And in chapter 34 and verse 5, Hallelujah. <laughs> and the Lord descended in the thick cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty. I used to worry about this. Because it sounds like, well, he's proclaiming mercy for thousands and now he's not going to clear the guilty? That means, when it says, I will no means clear the guilty, it means he won't make them clean until they are ready to meet God on the grounds of the mercy that he institutes for their forgiveness. That there's no other way that they can find mercy except they come through the blood of Jesus. They come through the way that has been prepared for them. And then they will receive mercy and be made clean and clear. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and so on. But this is the nature of our Father. This is his glory. Hallelujah. Oh, Father. And so in what place and on what occasion did actually the first feast of tabernacles come forth? You want to know that? That was in Solomon's temple in Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13 to 14. And it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice for the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. I believe historically that's the first fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. They never kept the Feast of Tabernacles in Egypt. They never kept the Feast of Tabernacles in the wilderness, but they kept it in the Promised Land. And that's where it is for us, in the land, in the realm of spirit, where we're coming into. And I don't feel to go into that anymore because I'm going to deal with it further, hopefully, tomorrow night, along with another avenue. But I just want you to know that the Feast of Tabernacles means the nearness of his presence in a way that we have never known before. If anyone has had a taste of the Feast of Tabernacles, this is their unanimous word. It's the nearness of his presence. And have we not longed for this? But you know, there is a price to be paid. And when we saw in the temple the glory of God came down, and man could not minister. So basically when we come into the Feast of Tabernacles, the Lord is wanting us to give it all to him and let him minister to us, talk to us, love to us, whatever. Forgive to us, show mercy to us. We're having Jesus on the throne and self is willing to have it so. Hallelujah. Not only willing, but anxious <laughs> because he's brought us to that place. So I don't want to tire you. You've just been wonderful to speak to. I feel such a response from you that, man, I could go on all night, but I won't. <laughs> and I just bless you in the Lord, and I, I trust that you'll consider these words. They were solemn words, and they are, because there is a price to pay for this Feast of Tabernacles. We're not just going to celebrate it. We are going to enter into it. It is the time. It came at the end of the year, 
And now we are at the end of the church age, and it is the time. And we are so blessed and so fortunate to be born in this generation when the Feast of Tabernacles is coming forth in reality that I almost pinch myself sometimes to, to realize how, how blessed we are to be in this day. So I just bless you all, my brethren, all the males that have come to the feast. Thank you for coming. <laughs> This concludes this message. For additional tape copies or for more information, you may write us Gary and Carol Sigler, 201 Union Avenue Southeast, number 187, Renton, Washington, 98059. Our telephone number is area code 425-430-2941. Our fax number is area code 425-430-2942. All of our messages are distributed on a no-charge basis as finances permit. These messages may not be sold, but you may duplicate them freely for distribution. If you have internet access, visit us at sigler.org. That's S-I-G-L-E-R dot O-R-G.